today's webinar, The Truth About Dementia and Caregiving. My name is Nancy Pewter, and I am the founder of Seco Seniors. Today, I will be interviewing three outstanding experts who are local and committed to working with individuals and their families as they cope with dementia and the task of caregiving. So before we get started, I want to get, give a big shout out to our sponsors. Without our sponsors, we wouldn't be able to continue to offer these seminars to you completely <clears throat> free of charge. And their generosity is what helps to keep Seacoast Seniors going. So thank you to our sponsors. Okay. I also would like to give a big thank you to my business partner, Gabriella. Gabriella is solely responsible for putting on these events. Thank you, Gabriella, for all of your hard work and your dedication to putting this important event together. And I will begin by introducing our panelists, Jenny Molinar, Laura Deloy, and Danny Danbaum. So first, I'll start with Jenny. Jenny has a background in memory care facility administration and has her MA from the Davis School of Gerontology at the University of Southern California. As owner of Guided Aging, she provides services all over San Luis Obispo County. She is a support group facilitator for the Alzheimer's Association and on the board of directors for the San Luis Obispo County Long-Term Care Ombudsman. Laura Deloy. Laura <clears throat> Deloy is the program and education manager at Alzheimer's Association, California, Central Coast chapter. Laura is an experienced founder with a demonstrated history of working in the health, wealth, and health care industries skilled in nonprofit organizations, clinical music therapy interventions with adults, event organizing, teaching music, piano, and interventions. Laura is a strong professional with a bachelor's of music education in music therapy from the College of Worcester. And last but not least, Danny. Danny Don Danbaum is the Community Relations Coordinator at the Villages of Sydney Creek, San Luis Obispo, with a bachelor's degree in recreation and hospitality management. Danny, which is short for Danielle, brings a wealth of knowledge and a sincere desire to be of service to her current position at Sydney Creek. Danny says, I want to be the advocate our community needs. She says, it's my pleasure to articulate who we are, what we do here, and how we might help. So welcome to all of you. And thank you for thank you. being here today. Yeah. The first part of today's webinar will address dementia and the myths and truths associated with it. The second part will be addressing the role of caregiver. When we are finished, we will answer your questions if you look at the bottom of the screen, you should see a chat box. You can type your questions there. If you would like to speak privately to any one of us, please be sure we have your contact information and we will, we will contact you after the webinar to um, connect you with the appropriate person. You may contact me directly at 805-710-2415 anytime by phone or text. And again, I will help to connect you with the person that you would like to speak to. Okay, so let's talk about brain health. Most of us have experienced memory lapses in either ourselves or a loved one and find ourselves wondering how to know what's a normal memory lapse and what's not normal. So Laura, can you speak to, um, what the signs are of a healthy or an unhealthy brain. Certainly, yes. So in the Alzheimer's Association, we have um, a, a program and kind of the, the signature 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, and they're 
I'll use Alzheimer's and dementia interchangeably. We'll talk about, about that in a, in a moment as far as dementia as, as an overarching um, umbrella term for the variety of different dementias that are variety of different diseases that have dementia as the symptoms. Um, but 10 warning signs, some of those oftentimes will think of, oh, I, I forgot these things, a lot of memory loss kinds of issues. But dementia really has different or additional um, components to really seeing, okay, something is awry possibly. So really looking at poor judgment and decision making versus just making a bad decision once in a while. We all make bad decisions, um, but these are really the judgment that, that changes a lot um, for somebody. Uh, it could be the, the idea of an inability to manage a budge budget versus missing one monthly payment. Like this may be somebody who's really used to doing, keeping track of the checkbook and the accounting, that's their thing, and all of a sudden it's really, messed up, there are a lot of different missed payments or extra payments, those types of things that happen. Um, and then there's the idea of losing track of the date and the season, maybe something that happens in dementia versus forgetting just what day it is. And now particularly for those in this time of COVID, we, many of us don't know what day it is. <laughs> um, so that's not a sign of dementia necessarily, it's a sign of change in our routine, right? So, um, but really losing track of that date and having no concept and really truly believing that it's December and not um, May is what we're in, right? May, <laughs> sorry. Um, got it. Um, and then other things like difficulty having a conversation versus just forgetting somebody's name and remembering it later. Um, really having trouble with the communication, the language, um, word finding, maybe words that get really mixed up in a sentence, um, calling calling an object something different, you know, like a, a hand clock versus a watch. That's, you know, those kinds of things that you're like, hmm, well, that's different and odd. That isn't usual. Um, also that idea too, like we all lose things. We misplace things. Um, where did I put that? If you're able to really retrace your steps um, and hopefully find the object or, or letter or whatnot, you know, you if you're able to do that and really, okay, 10 minutes ago I was, I was downstairs and I was in the kitchen. Okay, mm -hmm. it's nowhere here. I know where to look as opposed to really misplacing something and being unable to retrace those steps at all to find that um, object. And it may be looking in a completely different place. So those types of things where you're starting to see those changes, particularly in judgment um, and reasoning and attention, in addition to memory and, and communication loss. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to add on to that, Nancy, sure. real quick. So um, at the villages, there's two different types of communities. There's assisted living, and then there's <clears throat> Sydney Creek, where I work at, which is assisted living that specializes in memory care, where you have to have a diagnosis of dementia to be able to be a candidate at Sydney mm -hmm. Creek. I get a lot of people, of course, that are kind of like in the, the, the prospecting stage, where they're kind of getting their feelers out about the different communities. And a lot of times, um, most of us, we don't understand the natural aging process in the sense of we have the natural aging, then we have this big gray area, which is called minor cognitive impairment, also known as MCI, and then there's dementia. And it, even if you get to MCI or don't get to MCI again, which is minor cognitive impairment, that doesn't necessarily mean that you could get to dementia. You might, you might not. Um, but that's something to, to consider is to kind of know, is it the natural aging process or mm -hmm. is my loved one an MCI, minor cognitive impairment, um, or are they full-blown dementia? And of course, we've got the great resources with Alzheimer's Association or somebody like Jenny who can kind of help with a family in the process of even if it's just in the MCI stage to go, okay, here's the best communities to place my loved one with the potential that it could maybe get to dementia or not to dementia. 
And the biggest thing that I tell my potential residents is, because they always ask me, well, what's the biggest difference between minor cognitive impairment and dementia? For me, a little Dannyism is once somebody's in that stage of dementia, you worry about them. Where in minor cognitive impairment stage, you do, but you're not worried about their safety so much. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's, That's good. a good point. Jenny, um, yes. speak to us um, and, and uh, you know, answer this question, if you would. Is there anything that we can do to avoid dementia? Well, there's no foolproof, 100% certain way to avoid dementia, unfortunately. Um, but there certainly are some recommendations that I think are positive for one's overall health anyway, um, that um, certainly it are ways to improve our brain health and our physical health. Um, so obviously staying active, both physically and socially, um, you know, both our bodies and our mind need stimulation to, to keep working properly. And so I certainly recommend to folks, especially now even when we're in this shelter in place mode, we, there's still so many things we can do to stay active. We can still go for walks. We can still find ways to volunteer. Uh, and you know we can still do those puzzles on the computer or on a table to keep our brain moving. So there's so many physical um, and things that we can do and to keep our brain stimulated. Um, definitely monitor our current health conditions. You know, if we have um, if we know there's a history of high blood pressure in our family, then we need to stay on top of that and follow, you know, doctor's recommendations, take our prescriptions regularly. Um, so doing those things can certainly help keep our body and mind as healthy as possible. You know, the recommendation of not smoking, um, certainly following that, that's positive for both body and mind. Uh, and then also eating a healthy diet. Um, Mediterranean diet, it's a great diet. Lots of, there, there's quite a bit of studies that have shown that that is probably the best diet to follow for your brain health. Um, so reducing um, processed foods, eating heavily plant-based, reducing some red meat, um, those are things that can benefit us in general. And uh, you know, everything in moderation too. Um, enjoy that glass of red wine and just just staying um, staying moving and keeping our brains active too. So those are those are kind of the best tips that we've heard in general for just overall wellness. And that's what I tend to also encourage families if they're worried about you know not having you know that diagnosis of dementia. Let's take care of ourselves in general, and that will improve our overall health. And you know can't hurt. Okay, great. Well, you know, did I mention that we were recording? <laughs> I think I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that. And so um, I just want to let you all know who are attending the webinar today that we are going to be moving quickly and um, speaking to each of the panelists. And at the end, as I mentioned earlier, you can ask questions, but we are recording and this webinar will be available to you later. So I'm sorry, I just wanted to make sure I got that in there. Okay, so I think most of us know someone who has dementia or has had it, and some have even found ourselves in the role of caregiver, often without any warning. What I would like to talk to uh, talk about is some of the long-standing myths and uh, myths that are associated with age-related changes, getting older, and brain diseases like Alzheimer's. So would it be okay if I go through some myths one at a time and ask you to comment on these? Okay, so let's start with Laura. Laura, myth number one, dementia and Alzheimer's are the same thing. Um. So I will say the Alzheimer's Association, the real name is Alzheimer's. We work with people with, or, and caregivers with Alzheimer's and all other dementias. So that can be a little bit confusing. Um, but 
dementia, as I had mentioned just a little bit earlier, is more of a, an umbrella term to describe a variety of symptoms. Um, and some of those that we went through in the warning signs type of thing where there's cognitive decline of memory, of language, of problem solving, um, in, in that all is impairing daily function. Um, and so underneath, if you see dementia as the umbrella, underneath that umbrella, there are the diseases like Alzheimer's disease, um, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, um, frontal temporal dementia, Parkinson's disease with dementia, and a whole variety of others. Mm -hmm. There are 54, I believe that uh, I should wow. have that number in my head, um, but different types of dementia. And there are things too where um, if somebody has a UTI, urinary tract infection, that can really come out as symptoms of dementia and have that brain fog kind of thing, the confusion and that type of thing. So we always want to make sure that the people are getting um, an we, we encourage early diagnoses for dementia and Alzheimer's so that you know where, um, where to go and what types of things to plan for as, as people are getting into the process of the disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease is more often heard of in saying dementia because that Alzheimer's disease accounts for 60 to 80 percent of the dementia cases. Um, and then there's vascular dementia that, that comes in after that. So mm -hmm. I hope that makes, covers make sense. I think Jenny might have a little. Yeah, yeah, and I think that, you know, having said dementia is the umbrella um, and there's so many different kinds, I often will kind of relate it to, just as when you hear the word cancer, there's multiple kinds of cancer. It just depends upon where it's located in the body. All of the dementias are located in the brain. However, depending upon the kind of dementia, there you have, <laughs> Danny's holding up a, a sign. <laughs> um, but depending upon the kind of dementia you have, it depends upon where the damage is in your brain. Um, so there, there's so many different um, kinds, just as Laura said, I think, I think there are, you know, 50 plus possibly dementias. So um, it's definitely the umbrella. I'd like to add on that. The <clears throat> sign that I just kind of showed you, which will, you can definitely reach out to the Alzheimer's Association. That's a very powerful one page mm -hmm. uh, visual that a lot of times uh, potential families or families, they will actually come to my office and take pictures of that sign because it gives them kind of um, a little bit more of a over kind of generic um, quick visual snapshot of the disease and the different parts of it. Yeah, that is a really good visual because so many families will sometimes be like, oh, my mom, my mom, she has dementia. She doesn't right. have Alzheimer's or vice versa. She doesn't have Alzheimer's. She might have a little dementia though. So, <laughs> it's, you know, that, that is a great visual, Danny, and that is readily available on, at the Alzheimer's Association. It's very, right. very powerful. Maybe yeah. we can get a copy of that and post it on our website. For sure. Right. Yeah. Okay, myth number two. Danny, what would you say when someone says people living with dementia do not understand what is going on around them? I would say that's a yes and no question. It mm -hmm. just depends on the person. It depends on the time. It depends on the environment. One of the things that I've learned uh, working here for the last two years at Sydney Creek is it's a very bizarre disease. You just don't know what kind of things are going to happen. Um, some of our residents um, are very, very lucid <clears throat> and they do know what's going on. Um, they can keep a conversation, they can remember your name, but they don't know how to toilet on their own, or they don't know how to uh, properly eat, um, something basic. So uh, that's a yes and no question. Um, I was always told when you meet one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia, mm -hmm. and you've met that one person at that particular day, at that particular time, in that particular environment. Um, so for me, um, it just depends. I'm a true believer that even if they can't verbally talk to you, um, from what I've found working with my residents here at Sydney Creek is they know your energy. They can feel your energy. And even if maybe they don't know exactly what's going on, like per a conversation that you're having with them, 
they still feel the good vibes that they're that you're yeah. giving them and to me that's really all they need yeah i like that jenny would you like to yeah. add to that no i i well yes <laughs> but danny you know that's that's so important i mean that's something that you know i i worked in in a memory care for about nine years too and it's 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 so interesting in working in a with a a mass population such as that of how the vibe um in a community setting is, is so interesting and it, it's so important to at no matter where an individual is in the disease process that we should never ever assume um that one does not understand us so we should never speak in front of them if as if they are not present because we we just don't know um so we could have an individual who is um disoriented and confused 95 percent of the time um and might not be extremely verbal even but at that we could find them in their five percent moment of where they're picking up on what we're saying um if not what the words actually are but just our mannerisms and our our emotion and our feeling and so um we never want to assume that someone is not understanding um because it's it would cause unnecessary harm and um to them and upset them and um we we want to go about with utmost respect uh, around individuals that have this disease they are our family and our friends yep okay thank you so um laura how would you respond to myth number three you should correct a person with dementia when they make a verbal mistake um you know actually i had a caregiver just yesterday tell me and and she had cared for her husband for a number of years and he's he's has since passed but she said you know that whenever somebody's diagnosed with dementia they're always right she's like always and and it was great because we were she was we had a couple of other people who were caregivers and that she said that was super enlightening for me she said that was very difficult as a wife um but that they're always right and so that whole idea and within that what she's saying is arguing is not going to be helpful because mm -hmm. again the the processes that are happening in the brain throughout this disease is that the functions of reasoning well if this happens then that happens it deteriorates and is no longer viable to be able to say oh well but i know that's you know i know that this memory is what what it is and they're convinced and so mm -hmm. for us we really need to enter a reality of the person with dementia um it's very there's a in in therapy it's called an iso principle so you meet the person where they are even if that is some space where you're like i know this is not what happened um or i know that somebody is not outside that window looking in on us there was nobody else here today like i know that for a fact but there is an anxiety then mm -hmm. because what's happening is when they're communicating you're using what's still available to communicate and sometimes that may not connect correctly with what we know as reality or what has been our experiences with the person and our memories together um so arguing telling them oh that's not right that's you no know, try again tell me again what's my name those kinds of like continual questions are going to increase their anxiety 10 20 50 fold and in, in a heartbeat and then all of a sudden you're like okay well why are they withdrawing and we're not having a conversation anymore why are they withdrawing and don't want to go out to not that we're going out to dinner in a restaurant right now but no, don't want to go and you know see friends or be able to talk to somebody on the phone well because if they're constantly being told try again that's not right then you think oh well maybe i don't you know i know that something is going wrong like especially in the early stages where mm -hmm. folks are aware of something is changing and not liking it and there might be denial and so all of that adds to the anxiety the frustration and 
and can lead to anger then. And so, you know, none of us really like to be corrected. You know, we can be, um, you know, <laughs> no. we, we can have good feedback, right? Yeah. <laughs> but so figuring out how do we differently communicate um, with a person in the disease process. Um, you know, being able to have those conversations early on as far as, okay, the words are slipping or things are getting disjointed in conversation. Do you want me to help to fill in a word or would you like me to just give you more time? Like if you can have that conversation with your loved one early on, that can really make a, it can be a big game changer as you move forward through the disease process. Because there's also within taking more time, it will allow those connections to do what it needs to get those synaptic connections happening in the brain that um, may just take more time. And so being able to have that conversation can help to decrease the frustrations on the caregiver part as well as on the person with dementia. Um, so I would say don't always do that correction. <laughs> and if you do want to make a correction, like really be aware of how that sounds. And is it going to be something that makes a person withdraw? Or is it going to be something that makes you be like, no, I know I'm right. You know, so those <laughs> kinds of differences both and well i've seen it all i think we all have yeah. uh, how the spouse or the family member reacts to the person with dementia and i've seen the whole gambit and i always wondered what was the right way to go uh, in that scenario um Danny, I'd add to that. yeah, yeah. Um, part of the training that we do at Sydney Creek is to help with our care staff or our life enrichment team or really any departments here at Sydney Creek to enter into the reality of our residents. That's very important because it's not what we're used to. Um, and we want to be able to speak the language. Now, that might not be verbal, right? It could just be physical or that energy type, but it's really about trying to get to see it from their point of view, right? You can't really judge somebody until you walk in their shoes. You kind of have to see where they're at in their reality. And maybe instead of at that point correcting them, you're like, oh, I understand why you think that this is what it is. And then learning to play on it, but not play on it too much. Um, so there's that kind of gray area too, but definitely learning about that reality that they live in whether it's pleasant or unpleasant in trying to find um, where you can go from there. That's and, and, great. And I'll also say like really the, that concept is valid, is validation. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it may be, wow, you sound really upset. What, you know, what else is behind that? Those types of things, like really reflecting that conversation back. Okay, we have about uh, 10 minutes uh, to get through four more myths. So, <laughs> no problem. No problem. A, just a heads up, everyone. Uh, there's this, this conversation is just so deep that we've talked about doing a part two, so stay tuned. Um, Laura, what would you say to myth number four? Dementia is not fatal. Um, well, many people think, again, uh, dementia as just having some memory problems, but it really, as the disease progresses, it does lead to complete brain failure. Mm -hmm. um, that is what's happening in the brain as the plaques and the tangles affect every part of our body and our system. Um, there are sometimes um, other comorbidities, other um, disease processes that happen. Um, oftentimes, there could be hypertension or other cardiac issues so that could lead to you know not dying of dementia but of a heart attack or of cancer i mean it doesn't because you have dementia doesn't mean that you don't you know like you have this barrier where no other diseases are coming in that's unfortunately not the case um mm -hmm. so that could lead to a more sudden decline for somebody um but dementia is the sixth leading cause of death in the united states um and one in three, yeah, one in three older adults um, will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's or, or another dementia. And then once that, the, the length of the disease process can be four, four to eight years. Sometimes it can be longer. Some folks see that process in, in early things. It could be 10 years. It could be 15 years. Um, 
again, it's different for everyone. Yeah, my dad had was 20 years. Yeah. Oh, wow. 20 years before he yeah. passed away. Yeah. Could, so, I just add, could I just add one little quickie? Thing yes. On to that one? Um, you know, ultimately, you know, in kind of layman's terms, ultimately de ha having dementia, the progression of it, it's, it's where it starts to just shut off the electricity um, in the brain and the body. So the uh, things start just shutting down. And that's, you know, as Laura explained, yes, you can die from dementia, um, but ultimately it's the shutdown of the body and the other functions that happen. So um, most individuals certainly, you know, pass away from pneumonia most likely um, because they're, they're, they're not able to, to swallow as, as normal or they're, they become sedentary. And, and so that's what we typically see individuals pass away from pneumonia or something very similar to that. Or of course, their underlying condition or right. secondary prior yeah, diagnosis. Yeah. That's correct. Um, I think you can all comment on this one. Myth number five, only elderly people get dementia. <laughs> well, I'll definitely let you know that I have, I had three, um, but now I have two residents at the age of 65 and both of those residents have been diagnosed for at least over five years before they yeah. came to Sydney Creek. Um, I would definitely say that that's a myth, um, is that people think that it's for elderly people, but it's not. Um, yeah. Yeah. Young, youngest individual that I um, have worked with in the past 51. Wow. Yeah, so early onset Alzheimer's is actually ages, it, I see it in both spots. We say in the Alzheimer's Association 60 or younger, some people say 65 and younger, it kind of depends on where our, um, so our, our programs are and that type of thing. I actually did just speak this morning at 9 a.m. with a woman who's helping to care for her mother who is 45 and was diagnosed at UCLA with Alzheimer's dementia earlier this year and realizing that they've been struggling with things for the past three years. Um, so it's not completely uncommon, but it is not a common right. spot that really that early onset is about 5% of um, all people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, but it, it can be devastating. I have another uh, client right now who his wife is 60, I think she just turned 61 as well. And they have a son graduating from college this year. So it, it's not unusual. We, we know of it, but um, it isn't the most common. Yeah. yeah. Okay, myth number six. Who would like to speak on this one? Because someone in my family has dementia, I'm going to probably get it too. <laughs> genetic components? Yeah. There are, yeah, there is some genetic component. Again, it is not as um, likely. Uh, the specific, the deterministic genes, if we want to get a little genetic talk here, um, that's like less than 1% of, of all people have that gene. Um, and there has been some research that's happened on that. Um, but then there are also risk genes. And so that increases the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's. It's not saying that, yes, you are going to get it. So there was, uh, there's been research done on a gene called APOE4. Um, and all of us have an APOE gene. It just depends on whether it's two, three, or four, and then what combination that is that comes to us from our parents. Um, and we all, since we do all inherit that, it depends if we inherit one copy from uh, of an E4 gene, then we'll have an increased risk, risk of Alzheimer's disease. If we, you know, inherit two copies, then that's going to be a greater risk. But um, there are those risk factors. Um, our Hispanic populations and African American populations also have a higher risk increase. Um, a lot of times that's due, as Jenny was talking about earlier, to like diet and um, hypertension mm -hmm. and those types of things too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Jenny, I'm going to skip to myth number eight because I think uh, number seven has pretty much been covered. Number eight, a diagnosis of dementia means life is over. How would you respond to that? 
I would respond that it's false. However, I completely respect how someone might feel that it is if they have that diagnosis. Um, it's a completely devastating disease for the diagnosed individual and for the family and care team. Um, but I really encourage for positivity to be maintained and for individuals to focus on the strengths that they have and the abilities that remain as they go through this dementia journey. Um, there's still so much that they can do so well and give an experience. So um, I, like I said, completely respect um, the, the challenges that they will be facing, um, but let's enjoy the time that we still have together as much as possible. And, um, you know, during my years in the care industry, I've met so many individuals that have a diagnosis and are still actively involved in advocating for awareness, um, at, at really active in the Alzheimer's Association and um, helping raise funds for them and doing public speaking of this is what life with Alzheimer's looks like and there's still so much that they um, can accomplish and make a difference for their future and their friends and family's future. So. Um, you know, you're still able to do so much with this diagnosis. Uh, you can travel. Um, there's, you know, there's so many things that can still happen. And so um, I understand, respect that the challenges, the depression that may happen and the obstacles that will occur, but you can still move about and have fun and make the most of it. I'd like to add on that a lot of families, they do feel like their life is over when they come mm -hmm. and they're placing their loved one. And just like what Jenny says, I, I it sucks for a better or a Absolutely. loss of whatever you know, says it just sucks of the situation. And having that loved one, whether it's your your parent or a sibling or a loved one or a child, um, of who they once were is no longer who they are now. And some of the realities that some of our residents live in are very um, hard to watch. Um, but a lot of our residents specifically here at Sydney Creek, I'd say two thirds are happy go lucky. They're pleasantly confused. Yeah. They just can't live in our reality anymore because they would just walk out in the middle of the street without looking both ways because they're going north, you know, and to go north, you gotta cross the road, but they forget how to look both ways. I'm so thankful for the position I'm in because to me, when somebody gets placed, a lot of times the residents give more back to life to me in the simple things. I think that a lot of us look over is they live in the moment that a lot of us in mm -hmm. our reality today overlook. So a lot of what they're doing is basic life lessons or basic humanity that they're there. They just can't live in our reality, but they have so much to give. Majority of them have so much to give. There are those special cases where it's hard and it sucks and you just want to cry together and do counseling together and stuff to make it through and to push through. Um, but your life isn't over. It's, it's how you look at it. Yeah, that's a good point. Definitely a good point, Danny. Wow, that's a lot of good information. I can't believe how much I'm learning today after already looking into so much of it and experiencing it myself. So um, let's talk about caregiving. Danny, huh? I think you would be a good one to start with. Share with us how COVID-19 is affecting the caregiving of those with dementia, whether they are in their home or presently in a community. Mm -hmm. So, of course, welcome to the new world we live in, um, right? So right now, based on our caregivers, uh, we want to give them as much tools and resources as possible. Because right now, knock on wood, we don't have any COVID cases. Um, the only way that a COVID case is going to come in is through our care staff. So we want to make sure that we're giving them the tools like masks, hand sanitizers, cleaning products, not only here at Sydney Creek, but also outside of Sydney Creek because they have to go home and function too, right? So it's about making sure that we give um, all that type of stuff to our care staff. So again, whether they're here at Sydney Creek or outside of Sydney Creek, they can protect themselves. So when they come back to Sydney Creek, they can give the utmost to our residents. I'll let you know within the last couple of months, specifically wearing our masks. I'm going to put this on for an example. 
but if you had dementia and you could lip read still and now I'm giving you care and I'm wearing a mask or even if you couldn't lip read but now the new thing is wearing masks it's a little weird to get yeah. used to um, but interesting enough consistency with dementia does help in the sense that it eases things. So our residents are, are learning to adjust just like we are learning to adjust. Um, we have to get creative here at Sydney Creek of finding different ways that not only protect us, but protect the residents so that we can still speak their language because we still want to give them the utmost quality of life, even if we're in a pandemic, right? We want to make sure that, that they're going to have that life uh, fully, we get to live that life fully until the end. Um, so it's really more taking the precautions, um, following what our regulators, the Department of Social Services, um, CALA has provided. As of right now, the state of California has said no visitors, no visitations, unless um, somebody's at the point where they need um, some family because they're going to be passing soon. Um, just again, so that there's less exposure that's coming in, mm -hmm. um, right? Because when you're working with somebody with dementia, you can't isolate them. They don't understand what isolation is. Um, here at Sydney Creek, we have different neighborhoods. So it's not like we're mixing neighborhoods because we're in a pandemic. Again, we want to make sure that it keeps within a neighborhood. So there are some limitations and restrictions that we have set in place here at Sydney Creek. Again, to make sure that if it does come, it gets into just one neighborhood, not all the rest of the neighborhoods. But working with people with dementia and isolation, those two terms don't necessarily go together. But you just got to get creative and do your best. Yeah. That's good. Um, Jenny, would you like to comment how it's how COVID is affecting people that are still with dementia and 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 the caregivers that need to come into the home or have been coming into the home to help? Um, it's it's been challenging, um, <laughs> nonetheless. Um, so, um, a lot of the same things that um, Danny mentioned in a community setting that they're facing. Um, it, it, even individuals that are home at home that are having caregiving staff coming in, um, there's the same concerns there because they're, they're individuals that are coming into a home setting and then going to back to their home setting. So it's the back and forth and giving um, and working with the caregiving agencies um, to make sure that they're giving appropriate supplies to their caregiving staff, as well as having appropriate supplies in each home as well that they're visiting. So um, it's just making sure that we're covering all bases um, for, you know, taking those same universal precautions that we've always taken, but taking it to the next step. So um, that's what um, I'm reiterating with the families that I'm working with as just from, from the general sanitization of everything. Um, but even though ind an individual with dementia is in their own home and sheltering in place, there's still the same challenges of where they don't always comprehend of, I need to stay at home. Um, those outings um, that they may have been getting once or twice a week by either a caregiving staff or their loved one aren't ha always happening as often as they used to. Um, outings are still happening, but it's um, a much shorter walk or, or you know, an adapted version. So there's, there's just as we're all having some stir craziness, um, the, the individuals that I'm assisting caring for in homes are having that same stir craziness. Yeah. Hmm. And I would say too, Nancy, we're doing a lot more tracking than what we were doing before. So like even if a visitor comes in, like a home health agency comes in or a hospice nurse or even somebody like myself, we have to do a temperature, they write down our names, you know, there's a lot more tracking, which just so that if something does happen, we can then get a hold of those people to get a hold of those people so that it doesn't just spread since we are communal living aka a petri dish right right mm -hmm. i think you told me danny that you have had no covid cases at sydney creek no we've had no covid cases at sydney creek um and again it's not our residents right we it's if if covid's going to come here it's going to come a buy from employee coming right so it's something as simple as yeah we know how to wash our hands but <laughs> are you really washing your hands for the 20 seconds right is it something as simple as going to the gas station and picking up that gas I mean how dirty is that you know yeah. so we've gone through a lot of gloves a lot of hand sanitizers a lot of masks 
again, to provide that for our employees, because especially within the first month, we didn't want to take away from like the mm -hmm. local hospitals and stuff like that. So, but again, it's not only doing our due diligence here at work, but it's also outside of work so that yeah. again, it doesn't come in for any of us. Okay. So, um, Laura, do you have some tips for supporting persons living with dementia who are receiving the home-based services? Do you have some tips that you could give them? Um, yeah, and I think, are you speaking specifically during this COVID time as well? Kind of, um, that, or both, just either with or without COVID. Right, right. Um, we um, will certainly support as much as possible, being mm -hmm. able to have an outlet of um, conversation and connecting with others, um, for a caregiver to know that they're not alone, um, for a caregiver to know that, okay, my loved one is not a completely atypical in what this response was, and to be able to connect with other people. So the Alzheimer's Association, as Jenny is one of our support group facilitator volunteers, um, we still have all of our, almost all of our support groups going on, um, and they're, but they're happening online, on webinars or on telephone calls. So people can, and even if, you know, just like this, where we're doing the webinar, mm -hmm being able to come into a support group as jenny had yesterday we had six people on the call and so they're all able to come in and share their what's happening currently what are the changes that are they're going through um, the stressors and that type of thing um, really great connections that people get to share with one another um, a lot of times with support groups have been, we started them in the beginning of April and it was the first time that people had been on a video webinar so help to talk them through you know click the unmute no, the unmute is right wait, move your mouse you know and I can't see that so it, it's a really different type of thing but I've become a little bit of a tech savvy platform internet person not really my background um but it's been so good for folks to be able to and if they can't do the video call because some computers don't have the camera or just there's too much going on to try to figure that out people can just phone call in so we always have that as an option to the call they won't be able to see others um but it has been so neat when folks have come in and they're like <gasps> oh my gosh, I can see you. It's so good to see other people. And it's like you want to grab them and just, you know, like, as we all do. But um, that I think has just been really, I'm grateful that we've been able to still continue that. Yeah. We also have caregiver education classes that happen every month. Um, I do a two hour class prior to COVID. We were doing that in two different parts of the county. Right now I've merged that into one webinar. So yesterday I actually did a class and I had 25 people in the class online, and it was all about communication strategies for, for people working with people with dementia and caregiving in, in home or otherwise. And then we also have a, um, what we call a savvy caregiver workshop. So that's a little more intense. It's 12 hour workshop. Danny went to it actually last, two months ago, February. Um, again, no idea what month it is. Um, but I just started that this month and it's it'll go for five weeks. We've, we've changed it since it's an online format. Being in class in person in three hours is very different than being online for three hours for all of us. Um, as well as people are looking at these classes now while they're at home with their loved one who may wander in and out of the view in the class or need some other attention. So just really understanding that um, we've adapted our programs in that manner. Um, I do, we do have a, another Savvy Caregiver workshop beginning in June. I think it's the first Thursday um, and my cohort in Santa Maria is starting that, but because everything is online now, you could get into classes if you go to alz.org um classes from across the country support groups from across the country are happening had a support group last night there was a woman in um uh from arizona who logged into the the group there and all things are secure and you know we, we have the waiting room and all of that stuff so um definitely a good way to help support the caregivers who are at home still thank you danny I 
Yeah, I'd like to add on to that. Um, I highly recommend and I recommend everybody who comes through my doors here at Sydney Creek to reach out to the Alzheimer's Association, mm -hmm. specifically to the Caregiver Savvy Series workshops. Um, even though I go through intensive training here at Sydney Creek, it doesn't hurt to also get a different perspective of more ticks and tricks and tips, right, about a disease that's always evolving too. Mm. Um, very informative, very up-to-date, and it allows you to reach out and meet people that are going through similar situations. Um, I know it helped me in a different disease when I reached out and found other people that were going through it so that I could learn from others or be an advocate for others to help them through the process, even though that person might have a different um, story to tell or experience but it doesn't hurt. To me, knowledge is power. Worst case scenario, you don't use what you don't want and you pick up on those little golden nuggets and it allows you to better understand the disease than go, oh, my life is over. My mom's no longer who she is. Um, there's no more of her left, but really there could possibly be that gem. It's just about getting to that gem and, and creating that best um, life for her till the end. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID just because it's timely and a lot of people are dealing with it right now. Ginny, um, what would be some things to consider if your family member's residential community has an incidence of COVID-19? Well, well, certainly that is, you know, if you were informed of that, um, that that's something that you need to, you know, take with all seriousness and certainly see what those what does that really mean um and so uh, and how is the community handling it and um i know that this kind of might segue into some, you know what we were going to talk about as far as do you want to make that rash decision and move your loved one from that community and um i think that that's probably what would pop into most as the the first and automatic thing that they would want to do or consider doing and and i don't you know think that you know that that you need to really give that a lot of thought if that's what you really want to do um to to pull your loved one out of an environment that they're used to being in because um you know consistency is so important and there is trauma from moving you know, someone from their current location. And so um, less moves the better. So I would certainly encourage families to um, have a strong conversation with the administration of the community of how are they handling this? Um, is the individual, uh, of course, they would be isolated as, as well as possible. Um, so having a strong conversation with the administration of the community and um, then really looking at the big picture of what that would really entail in moving your loved one home. Um, I, and probably 97% of the scenarios, if I was working with a family that was going through that experience, I would recommend that they leave their loved one at the community because it would ultimately do more harm than good of uprooting someone. And there's still the same risks of having someone caring for someone at home, um, probably more risks actually, um, than if they were at that community where they could be kept as safe to, as possible. So um, th that's certainly, I, no rash decisions if that were to happen because um, probably an individual is safer living in a community setting right now than at home with constant care coming in and out. Mm. Danny, yeah. what, what are some of the things that you would say to someone who that they should consider before moving someone out of a care community? Well, I think what, yeah, what's hard about this time is we're in uncharted waters, right? There's really no set game plan. We've never gone through this before. And like even what Jenny, and I agree with Jenny, I would leave my loved one there just knowing that they've already been exposed to COVID-19 at that point. Mm -hmm. Once somebody else has already been di or diagnosed with COVID-19, more than likely everybody at that community, again, going back to the Petri dish, has been exposed and then working with the clientele, like with people that have been diagnosed with dementia, like Jenny said, it could be very um, hard for them to move and not understand what's going on. You're taking away the space that they're very familiar with. So that has to be more of 
what's best for you, yeah. um, knowing that you have a plan in the future. Because a lot of times during a pandemic, people make rash decisions, right? And we've seen that, um, not here at our community, but over at my other campus where loved ones um, not diagnosed with COVID, it was the beginning of the pandemic, moved their loved ones out of the assisted living, took them home, which I understand that initial like, oh, I don't want to get them exposed. However, now they're at home, their loved ones can't take care of them. They want them back in assisted living. And it's harder now to get back into assisted living mm -hmm. just because we're all taking the precautions necessary. Because yeah. again, we don't want to be the community that brought somebody, a resident in. I mean, we're already dealing with making sure our employees don't bring it in, let alone a resident to come in mm -hmm. um, to then affect others. So it is definitely, it's one of those kind of like day by day, hour by hour, we kind of have those precautions in place. Like even if somebody's coming to Sydney Creek, we still have to do our due diligence of a 602, that physician's report, whether it's a pandemic or not a pandemic, that 602 physician's report is always so hard to get. We still have to do an assessment. Then with this whole COVID-19, we have to kind of watch who's going in and out of their home or a different community they might be coming from. We might ask them, them to kind of isolate themselves at that community or try to take them home at the home to isolate, to then bring them maybe a temperature before. Again, it's kind of case by case, day by day, hour by hour. Um, but in regards of moving a loved one out, I would highly recommend that you think through that plan mm -hmm. first and that you have a plan, um, not only to bring them home, but what happens when they, you can no longer keep them at home? What is your plan to move them back or where do you go from there? Great information. Okay, well, let's open it up for questions. If anyone has, who's listening has a question, you can type it, uh, click on your little box at the bottom of the screen that says chat, and you can type in your question. Right now, we don't have any questions. <laughs> we have some nice compliments. Hey. We have some nice compliments. Hey. Uh, great information. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you for doing this. That's from Jana. <laughs> So, um, Gabriella, did you have any questions with all of this coming up? I mean, they, everybody was so thorough. Well, that's okay. That's all right. Just remember, you can always get a hold of me, and we can make sure that your questions are answered. Uh, Larry says, I've learned so much. Thank you. And Clarice says, great job to one and all of you. Okay, well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for participating today, your willingness to take the time to provide this valuable information in the midst of your busy work schedule is a testimony to your level of commitment to getting the truth out there about dementia and caregiving. You are my heroes, and I'm honored that you've donated your valuable time today. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded and will be available to you after today's event. And for those of you who don't know, in addition to my role as founder of Seaco Seniors, my day job is as a realtor at Nancy Pewter and Associates, Keller Williams, Pismo Beach. My hope is that you will consider me your resource, not only for uh, in to, to obtain information for older adults and their families, but also if you or anyone you know is in need of real estate services. I wanna thank you for attending our webinar today and we look forward to seeing you again at one of our future events. I do want to mention to you that our schedule on the website is uh, going to be changed. There'll be a new one up tomorrow because of COVID. We're not sure yet where our next one is going to be, whether it's going to be a webinar or an in-person seminar. But the, uh, regardless of what it says on the website today, the next topic will be the truth about staying independent. So once again, I would like to thank my sponsors uh, for making this possible, uh, this webinar possible today, and for all of their support in allowing uh, and making SECO seniors be able to provide quality seminars and webinars to you on a regular basis. So all of you stay safe and thank you again. Bye.